We are starting a brand new series today, a series we are calling Family, God's Big Idea. And we are looking at how God built a family to be the primary unit through which he disciples people. The primary unit from which he passes faith on from one generation to another. We're going to look at that in a very broad, general sense this morning, and then throughout the next several weeks in April into the first week of May, uh, we are going to look at more specific parts of the family unit. Marriage, parenting, uh, honoring your parents, those sorts of things over the next several weeks. Um, Jared is going to step in for me at one point during this series, just kind of depending on um, when Cheryl and I need to be out, uh, when Canon comes. Uh, but uh, hopefully you will, uh, this will be meaningful to you no matter what season of life you're in, uh, whether you're single or whether you're a grandparent. Uh, I believe that the things that we are teaching, the biblical truths that we will be teaching over the next several weeks uh, are important for family in, in all of its definitions. Uh, again, whether you're a single parent or whether you're, uh, you know, are married with a house full of kids, whether you're newly married and don't have kids, whether you're single uh, and you consider family more of uh, less of a blood connection and more of a relationship connection, uh, we just encourage you to come and be blessed. And, and hopefully uh, God will begin to do something in our church that can transform the way that we look at ourselves, can transform the way that we look uh, at ministry. And so again this morning, starting out with this family series, uh, I'm going to start in a very broad sense, and in a lot of ways we're going to be talking about priorities this morning. Um, you've probably seen the illustration that I'm going to do, but I encourage you to bear with me. Uh, as we think about life and the priorities that we have in life, we realize that life is a finite thing. We only have a certain amount of time and resources available to us, and we cannot change that, much like this face here. There's only so much that is going to fit within this face. Eventually, you run out of room and things overflow, and you're not able to hold everything that you might want to be able to hold. We know that certainly in our fast-paced life today, that there is only so many hours in a day to go around. There's only so much energy that we have to go around to commit to those things that we view as important. And a lot of times in our lives, we find ourselves spending a lot of time doing the little things, the things that we wouldn't value, uh, that we wouldn't put much importance on at all, uh, such as watching our favorite show on Netflix or um, browsing social media, uh, texting friends, uh, whatever that might be. And so that little stuff takes up a good, a good chunk of time. And then we have the things that are certainly more valuable, but not what we would put in our top five or six list of priorities. Things like our, our job, our finances, uh, activities, our kids' activities, social circles, interactions, those sorts of things. And we add those to the mix as well, and you already kind of see that we're, we're beginning to run out of space. And then, of course, we have those priorities. Those things that if someone were to ask us, what's the most important thing to you, you would have a list. Maybe you'd have a list of God, um, your marriage, your relationship with your kids and other family members, uh, church life, and uh, 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 maybe close friends or other people, again, that you would call family. And as you see, there's just not enough room for everything. Something gets left out uh, when you look at it in this way and realize that life is finite. So maybe we start over. Maybe we arrange things in a different way, and, and maybe that's the answer to all of this. And so we're going to pour it all back out, and we're going to try to start over real quick. Bear with me as we start over. And again, as we're doing this, think about things in your life that might fit in these categories. Things that might be the non-essentials, the things you enjoy but you certainly wouldn't call important. Things you would see as important like finances, but you wouldn't put in your top five or six list of important things. And so maybe if we do it differently and we arrange things differently, we start with our main priorities. God, family, um, our relationship with our spouse, relationship with our kids and the rest of our family, church life, and closest friends. And we kind of arrange things in a different order. Maybe then things will fit differently. And then we go on to the less important things, but still not totally insignificant things like our job and our finances and our social lives. And we add that to the mix as well. And while we see that it's filling up, maybe there's enough space left if we just shake everything together there so that we can even fit the little things, just the trivial things that we enjoy. And as we pour that in, we see that if we just arrange things differently, if we just put family first, that everything else fits nicely into the amount of time that we have. 
Now again, many of you have probably seen this illustration at some point. Uh, the first time I saw it was over 10 years ago at a high school graduation that I attended. Uh, I believe it might have been Cheryl's graduation. Um, and I've seen it several times since. Uh, those of you who have Facebook, you've probably seen this posted on a wall somewhere along the way. This kind of object lesson to talk about priorities. But like most metaphors, this metaphor falls apart. Because there's something wrong with this metaphor. And maybe you sensed it when you've seen it just now or when you've seen it for the first time. And that is it's too neat, isn't it? It's just a little too perfect, right? It's, it's too good to be true because... The false truth in this metaphor, and there is a good truth, that you need to put the first things first. We certainly agree with that and don't uh, want to, you know, harm anybody's intentions on trying to draw that truth with this object lesson. But the mistruth in it is that if we just arrange things differently, we'll have time for everything. That if we just put family first, everything else will fall into place and we can do everything that we want to do. As if, again, we just arrange things correctly, we'll have enough time for everything. But this is a lie, because a lot of times the things that are of little to no importance, if we would really sit down and write down our list of priorities, take up much more time than a grain of sand. How many of you this past week spent more time on social media than you did discussing things of importance with your family? We know for fact that a lot of times we can spend time doing the unimportant stuff just as much as we would do on the important stuff. And so instead of them being marbles and grains of sand, we realize that the unimportant stuff and the only moderately important stuff can become just as big grabs of our time as the super important stuff. And what happens there? Again, life is finite. Our time is finite. And so we put maybe one or two priorities in, and then we find ourselves so busy with, with jobs and finances, and we find ourselves so busy with activities and, and taking kids from point A to point B that eventually... There's just not enough room for everything. You see, this is more indicative of the way life truly is. You will not fit everything in. There will be some things that you must say no to. If there's one thing we know in the, in the year 2016 in the United States of America, it is that there is simply not enough time in the day to get done everything we want to get done to do everything that our hearts desires. So a simple truth that I want to present to you this morning is this. You don't have time for everything. And a question along with that is what will you leave out? What will you say no to? As your church and as leaders of your church, we don't want you to say no to your faith. First and foremost, we don't want you to say no to God. We don't want that to be the thing that gets left out. And very closely behind that, we don't want your family to be left out either and your relationship with them, which is why we are talking about the importance of family the next several weeks, and which is why on May the 1st, we're going to launch a new initiative here at First Baptist, an initiative we are calling our Home Connection Ministry. This will be a ministry in which we look at everything we do as a church through the lens of the home, through the lens of the family about how we can resource you to do the work of ministry in your home. We will have a center here in the church, in, in the hall, back here in this direction towards the CDO wing, that will have all sorts of resources that can help you and your family and through different points of life, whether you're dealing with a rebellious teenager, don't look to your teenager sitting beside you, or whether you're struggling in, in marriage or you're going through um, um, some sort of tough issue, whatever issue it might be in your family, we will have resources to give you, to put in your hands, to help you with those sorts of things. We'll also try throughout the year uh, to have it certain initiatives in which we actually give you something to take home, something that you can do with your family, a little recipe card over to how to have a family night or, or how to have a game night or things you can actually do to elicit faith conversations in the home. And again, this ministry is going to be called Home Connection and we'll be talking about it the next several weeks. But one thing you're going to hear me say over and over again the next several weeks and probably from now on and you'll hear Jared say when it's his opportunity, is this, you can do it and we can help. You can do this thing called family. You can do this thing called ministry and discipling your family and we can be here alongside of you to help. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter five, verse eight, we see Paul addressing through Timothy 
We see Paul addressing a need in the church, a need for certain people, certain family members to be taken care of. In 1 Corinthians 5 in particular, he's talking about widows especially and how people ought to care for widows. But Paul is also noticing another issue, and that is the issue of some people in the church not caring for their own, their own family. And one of the tougher verses to read when it comes to how to look at the family in the church, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, Paul writes this to Timothy. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Again, if you read throughout the whole chapter of 1 Timothy 5, you'll see the crisis that Paul is addressing. There were widows in the church that were not being cared for. In this chapter, Paul writes of how that is important, how the church ought to take care of widows. But one thing he makes clear in the chapter is that if the widow has any relatives in the church, if the widow has any believing relatives, relatives who follow Jesus, then those relatives ought to take care of her first. And the church should come in and fill fill in the gaps or pick up the slack. So that's Paul's solution to the problem of people not being cared for. Let the family take care of that person. And if there is no family available, then the church will step in and do that work of ministry. Later in the chapter, Paul says, again, that if any believing widow has a relative, they ought to care for her and not the church. It is the each person's job. It is each family's job in Paul's way of thinking when it comes to Timothy's congregation. It is each family's job to take care of their own, and the church fills in the negative space. Well, we see that in our own time as well, don't we? When, when a loss is experienced, whether it's an actual widow or someone else who loses someone dear to them or, or a church family that's going through, a, a family in the church going through a difficult time. Uh, not too long ago, when, when Bill and Lynn, our traditional music uh, leaders, when Bill had a, a, a struggle with uh, cancer, we stepped up in. We had some people in the church suggest that we take a love offering. We did. It blessed them significantly. And we see that's when the church steps in, when there is extenuating circumstances, when there is a way that a person needs to be cared for that the family or they themselves cannot meet, the church steps in and meets that need. You can do it, though. And we can help. It is when family is unable to meet the need that the church steps in. And so this crisis, the crisis of widows not being cared for, it gets compounded by the way that the church, that Timothy is ministering to, by the way that they react. In chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says that when the church cares for those who have relatives in the church, it burdens the church. Now, that might seem uncaring or unloving by Paul, but think about what he's actually saying. He goes on to spell it out. It keeps the church from serving those who need it the most. Again, think about the resources and time and effort and money that the church has. It, too, is finite. It, too, eventually runs out. It's the reason why when we have someone come and ask for some sort of assistance, we have certain questions that we have to ask them because we only have a limited amount of supply to help people, and so we want to make sure that need is real, that need is, is, is uh, you know, an extenuating circumstance, and we step in and meet that need as a church body when it comes to that point. But every every person that walks through the door and says, hey, can I have 50 bucks? We don't just hand them 50 bucks. In the same way, when it comes to our family ministries, Paul is saying that if there is someone there that can care for that person, they should be the one that should care because the church's resources should go to those who have no one to care for them. The true least of these that Jesus talks about in Matthew 25, that is where the church ought to be expending those resources. And that leads Paul to say what he said in the the scripture that we read, verse 8. Again, one of the most, if not the most pointed scripture when it comes to ministering and discipling your own family. He says that a person who does not, not, not care for his relatives and especially the people within his own household has denied his faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Worse than an unbeliever, that's pretty, that's pretty bold, that's, that's pretty pretty high level to live up to, to think about what Jesus is saying. But think about it. Those of you who have children or have ever had children, those of you who've cared for a child at any point, when you tell them not to do something, it it changes your reaction when they do that thing, right? 
Corbin does something that I don't want him to do, but I haven't communicated that to him, I might get on to him and scold him simply because I don't want him to do it again. But if I've told him 25 times not to do it, and then he continues to do it, it's going to be a different reaction from me, right? He's going to get a different spirit from his father. Uh, it's going to be a heavier hand of correction. Uh, it, it's going to be, you should know better. And essentially, that's what Paul is saying about the church. We should know better. We who claim to live and, and follow a life after Jesus Christ, who came and said when he was asked, what's the most important command? Who said, love your God and love your neighbor. Love God and love each other. That sums up everything in Jesus' mind, he says in the Gospels. And Jesus imparted that faith to us. And so we, as followers of Jesus, we, of anybody else in the world, we know better. Especially when it comes to the people to whom we are the closest. Our families. Our deep, dear friends. When it comes to those people who aren't just some nameless neighbor, but people that we live with, the people that we have taken vows with. When it comes to those people, if we can't care for them, that's worse than an unbeliever because we know better. We have professed to know better. And we are held to a different standard because of that. It's like being a denier of your faith. Yes, Jesus says to love God and love others, but somebody else can take care of my family. You see, it's easy to see the selfishness in this story, in, in Paul's words to Timothy and to the people that Timothy ministers to. It's easy to see the selfishness in the way they're behaving because essentially it comes down to not wanting to give up the money or the resources, to not wanting to provide a space for them to live or uh, some money for them to buy food, talking about the widows. And everybody would say, if you have a widowed person in your family and you're not taking care of them, that's selfish, right? That's almost pretty universal that you would think something is wrong. If there's a relative, they ought to be taking care of that person. There's nobody that's going to have any qualms with that sort of statement. But I submit to you today that the church... And Christian families within the church find ourselves in a very similar situation. Not necessarily when it comes to a physical place for somebody to live, but when it comes to something much more important, the faith development of our families. And many Christians today have outsourced that faith development of their families to the church. Paul was writing Timothy, who was facing a crisis. We too today when it comes to family ministry, of discipling the families in our church, we too today are facing a crisis. A fairly recent LifeWay study says that about 70% of all young adults who have attended church regularly for at least a year, at some point will drop out of church life. Many of them will come back when they have children and, and, and realize the importance of church, but at some point, 70% of young adults who spent at least one year in church will fall away, and many of them will never come back. And when we look at another statistic, and this statistic, when I say it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm going to say 10% of people don't do something, and so that means that right here in our midst, if the statistic is true, that 90% of you fall in the negative spot in this statistic, so I don't want you to feel nervous or I don't want you to feel guilty. I'm going to show you that there's great potential in what we're talking about this morning, but we have to deal with the facts first. 70% fall away. And less than 10% of Christian families, closer to about nine, are having regular faith discussions at home. Beyond just talking about what happened at church, having two or three times a week at least, less than 10% of families are having faith conversations at home. Even many of the most church active, meaning people who darken the door of a church every time it's open, many of the most church active people in our communities they outsource the faith development of their children, of their wives, of their husbands, of their siblings, of their elderly parents. They outsource that faith development to the church. And it is seen solely as the job of church leaders and professional Christians. It is primarily your job to lead your family towards Jesus, towards discipleship, and not the church's. Let me state that again. It is primarily your job to care for the faith development of your family and not the churches. Now look, we're going to expend every effort and every dollar that we have available in our budget to do the work of discipleship. 
but it is primarily the job of the family. And I'll talk about that here more in just a moment. And so that's the crisis, right? And this is the solution for each of us to care for our own families on our own time. We need families that view spiritual care for each other as a top priority, as the main thing, the thing that goes in the bucket first, the thing that stays in the bucket regardless of what else we take out. Families that have regular faith conversations, families that have regular times around the Bible with devotion, with prayer, families that make time for God and for each other with each other. And so it means saying no to certain things that you can say yes so that you can say yes to the most important things. Again, this illustration is powerful because it shows us the finite nature of life. What is it that you want to leave out? What is it that you want to say no to? Because even though I wish it was a nice little, you know, fairy tale where everything would fit perfectly, you and I both know that there are things that are simply not going to fit in our schedule. So what are you going to say no to? Your work or your kid? What are you going to say no to? Building a firmer relationship with your wife or your husband or hanging out with friends on Saturday night? What is it you are going to say no to? I'm not saying, saying you have to say no to those certain things, but you're going to have to say no to something. And what is it going to be? What are we going to say no to so we can say yes to the most important things? That's something I want you to think about throughout this entire series. Saying no to sometimes even good things so we can say yes to the best things. It is primarily our job to lead our families, not the churches. The church can come and fill in the gaps. When you have something in the, in the Bible that's beyond you or your child asks you a question and you're like, I have no idea how to answer that question. That's what we're here for. We're here to resource you so that you can help your child answer that question. And if that's not going to work, if it's something that you think is just totally beyond you, we can help you work through that. And we might be able to finally answer the question or point you to somebody who knows more than, even, than, than we do. That's what we are here for. Because you can do it. And we can help. We can come alongside in those tough moments when somebody in your family is suffering through depression or suffering through the loss of a job and you're not able to perform those duties that you would normally want to be able to. We can come alongside you and lead you through that. We can do things like marriage counseling. We can meet with kids one-on-one -on -one that are walking through difficult situations. And we can do those things not because we want to be known as the church with the greatest youth ministry or the greatest marriage ministry or all of that, but simply because we want to empower you, the main source that God decided to use to impart his faith from one generation to the other. We want to give you that power, all the resources you need to do the work of discipleship in your home. You can do it, and we can help. And now just like with Paul's, with Timothy's situation, the crisis gets compounded. The crisis that people are falling away, kids mainly, young people, are falling away from the church. And the crisis is compounded when the faith development of the family is outsourced to the church. Better church programming is not the answer to crisis. Uh, let me tell you what I mean by that. We are in a period in church history where we are more innovative than perhaps we have ever been in the church as a whole. Because we see the nature of the decline of faith in our country, we spend hours racking our brains as church leaders trying to figure out strategies that would curb that downward trend. We have a staff meeting every Tuesday, and in every staff meeting, so at least weekly, but probably daily for many of us, we are strategizing and thinking together about things that we might do in order to build faith to make disciples of the next generation, of the current generation, so that our faith might increase and not decrease. And that has led to churches doing amazing things, churches doing incredibly creative things, churches with budget much larger than ours, building these huge campuses just for youth or just for children. I mean, you've probably seen those churches, right, where they have kids' church and like upstairs and they come downstairs to see their parents by going down a slide. I mean, how cool is that? We're spending more money. Don't get any ideas, anybody. We're spending more money than we have ever spent in children's ministry, in, in youth ministry. And that's good. That's fine. We should because that's where the battleground is. But that's not the solution. That's a way to help resource the solution. But in a way, programs can sometimes get in the way. 
We work tirelessly to try to provide relevant expressions of our faith so that people can connect with God and connect with each other. Yet, the problem remains. No matter how much money we spend, no matter how much effort we place on ministry programs, the numbers do not turn around. The 70% does not become 50%. And so it's not because the church needs to be more relevant. I know that's what you hear a lot in the world today and you see on social media, that if the church just tried harder to connect with people, that everything would be fine. The church is working its tail off, trying to be relevant in a society that changes every day. We're doing everything that we can in order to reach people through relevant music. We have great music here, right? Can I get an amen from the folks in the house today? We have great programs here. We have great Sunday school teachers. We have a great children's minister. We have a great youth minister who happens to be a ninja. You can't get more relevant than that, okay? It's not about being more relevant. It's not about spending more money. It is about putting the effort in the right place. And that effort must be placed in the home. So let me take a moment after I put a bunch of stuff on you and probably stepped on some toes to give you a confession, perhaps even an apology, on behalf of church leadership in general. We love programs too much, especially in the Baptist church. Look at our calendar, <laughs> you know, for goodness sake. We keep you busy. We want to give you opportunities to do that, but, but what happens a lot of times is that it becomes just another thing to do, another activity to attend. And if that's ever what church becomes for you, then I would encourage you, and you're, yes, you're gonna hear your pastor say this, take some time away from some of those things. <laughs> And I'm not saying take some time away and go to the mall or take some time away and go watch the Rangers play or something. I'm Take some time away and make that family time. Make that time where you stay at home and you think about the important things in life. Because, listen, the most important faith development on this planet does not take place inside a church. It takes place inside the home. I am not, I should not be, the most important faith leader in the life of your home. You should be. Parents especially. That's where faith development happens. And because we as churches love programs, and because we love numbers, and we love to compare numbers, sometimes we get so caught up in the programs that we lose sight of what really matters. We lose sight of coming alongside of you, resourcing you, and empowering you as a family to do the true work of ministry. And so if that has ever happened, if you have ever been beaten to death because you think you have to be at every service, and you find yourself exhausted just from going to church alongside the other activities that you have to do, I apologize. Seriously, if that's what it is, say no to something. Even in the church, say no to something so that you can say yes to what is most important. Even if that hurts our bottom line of numbers. Bottom line. As if numbers is the bottom line. Life change, discipleship is the bottom line. And that starts at home. So the blunt truth is this. The stakes are incredibly high. If faith is not shared and nurtured at home, statistics tell us it will most likely die. It's not because your kid is less faithful than any other kid. It's not because your marriage is weaker than other marriages. It's simply because that's the way things are. If faith is not developed and nurtured inside a home, chances are that faith will perish. It's not the church's job to spiritually nourish your family. It's not the church's job to make sure your husband feels respected. It's not your church's job to make sure that your, spouse, your, your wife feels loved and feels compassion from you. It's not the church's job to make sure that your child feels nurtured, feels encouraged to explore the opportunities that are in their heart and in their mind. It's not the church's job to make sure that you and your siblings have a great relationship. It's not the church's job to make sure that your elderly parents that are in a nursing home somewhere have people to look after them and visit them occasionally. It's not the church's job to make sure that your family is perfect or works perfectly or to fix all the issues within your family. We will come alongside you and we will help with that. We believe it is our job to resource you in order to help defeat those issues. I'm not saying we're gonna step back and say no more. I'm saying we're finally gonna step up and say, it's not about us, it's about what God is going to do in your family. 
And we are here alongside of you to help you do what you can do through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and from God within you. So this is the promise to the problem. God has empowered the family unit to succeed in faith development. God has built society in the way that he has for a purpose, on families, because that's what God decides to use to impart faith from one generation to the next. How many of you in this building right now are here partly because of your parents' faith? Now, there's going to be some of you that didn't. You're going to be one of those that, that, that God was, you know, he, he, he plucked out of the fire, right? Uh, that you come from a terrible background. Your parents were terrible Christians or not Christians at all. Uh, but most of you in this room probably have a testimony similar to mine. Your parents believed, and in some way, some imperfect manner, they imparted that faith to you. And of all the sermons that I've sat through, I remember conversations that I've had with my parents longer than I will ever remember. Three points and a poem. And I stand here today, not advocating our responsibility as a church, but telling you, we are not the most important element in faith development. The family is. And so that's why we are going to start looking at what we do differently. Everything we can do to empower you, to resource you, to inspire your family towards conversations, we are going to step up to that plate. God has empowered the family to succeed. The love and spirit of God dwells within you. And that is why I can say rather confidently, when it comes to the development of faith in your family, you can do it and we can help. This morning during our time of invitation, I want you to think about how you would define your family. Again, whether it's the, you know, the typical 1950s version of the nuclear family or whether you're a single parent or whether family is, is again, less of a blood connection and more of a familial relational connection. Whether you're retired and kids are grown, whether you're dealing with elderly parents reaching the end of life, whatever situation in which you might be. What does family mean? And then... This is a sobering reminder. Think about the time that you have. What do you want to say yes to? And what are you going to have to say no to so that you can say yes to those things? You can do it. We can help you do it. You see, one danger of this sermon is that you leave here feeling guilty. That you leave here kicking yourself because you're among the 90% that don't have regular faith conversations with your family members. Because you're busy. I know, we understand. This is a busy time. I don't want you to leave here feeling guilty. I don't want you to leave here kicking yourself about, well, you know, the pastor said this and I can't, I'm not even close to that. We haven't had a regular faith conversation in like six years, let alone within the last few weeks. I'm a terrible father. I'm a terrible mother. I'm a terrible spouse. I'm a terrible child. I'm a terrible sibling. I'm a terrible grandchild or grandparent. I'm not leading in the way that I should. That's not at all what I want to impart. Instead, what I want to impart is this. The hope that I have that faith in families can change the spiritual outlook of our entire country. And that if we start at home, we can reverse the trend. We can not only reverse the trend, I believe we can grow to be stronger than we have ever been. But it must start at home. It must begin with your family. And so that is a word of optimism. Think about it. If all of us in this room, if we devoted ourselves to putting the first things first and saying no to the other things we needed to say no to, if we devoted ourselves to owning our own faith development and owning the faith development of our families, if we did that for one solid generation in the church today, Starting with like my son's age. He's four years old. I have another one's going to be born at any time, right? I can get a text message at any moment. So if you see me run, you know what's going on. <laughs> if we take this generation and devote ourselves to raising them in that way, if that happened in our world today, we would not be talking as much about the rise of the nuns, about the people, more and more people falling away from the church and saying they don't have any faith. Instead, we would be talking about a resurgence. We would be talking about a mass coming back to faith. 
Because even though we are more innovative than we have ever been, and even though we have great ministries, I fully believe and support our staff and believe that we have great ministries here at this church. What is done two hours on Wednesday evening can be undone in a moment on Thursday at home with a fight. What we do here on Sunday morning for an hour or two can be undone in a moment by a harsh word from a bully at school. It's not just once or twice a week. That's why we're so powerless. Because we have only moments. You have every day with your family. Yeah, you have school and work, but you have every day. Every day has a moment or moments in it that you can build faith in your family. You have that opportunity to say yes and through your family allow God to change the world. We can be on the front lines of the next great awakening, but it's not going to happen through great preaching or great programs. It's going to happen through godly families. You can do that. And we can help you do it. During this time of invitation, again, what does your family look like? Do you need prayer about discipling your family in whatever position you're in, whether you're the youngest kid or the oldest parent? If you need to pray about that or anything else this morning, I will be here to pray with you. The altar will be open. You can find me after the service as well. Let's stand together. I'm going to pray. You move in whatever way God is calling. Allow him to speak to you. Father, again, we thank you for this moment, for this morning. God, we thank you here for being here with us. We thank you for your son, Jesus. And God, we thank you for the faith that saves us, for the salvation you've given to us. And God, I pray that through our love for our families, God, that we would put the faith development of our families before all of the other activities that the world is begging us to do, that we would own it, and that through that ownership, God, that you would change our families and change our church and change our nation and change our world. God, we believe you can and we believe you will if we step up to the plate. God, move in us. Do something amazing in us. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.